much, Ari, and thanks for inviting me to come back. Um, so let's see if I can make this work, share the screen. And you all should now see, yeah, good. So I want to begin by um, reading from this document. And this is a harem document that was pronounced in Amsterdam uh, within the Portuguese Jewish congregation called Talmud Torah. The Senhores of the Ma'amad, that is the, the board of directors of the community, make it known to you that they have been aware for some time of the evil opinions and acts of Baruch de Spinoza, and that they have endeavored by various means and promises to turn him from his evil ways. But being unable to effect any remedy, and on the contrary, each day receiving more information about the abominable heresies which he practiced and taught, and about the monstrous deeds which he performed, and having many trustworthy witnesses who have reported and testified on all of this in the presence of the said Espinoza, who has been found guilty, after all of this has been examined in the presence of the rabbis, they, that is the members of the board of directors, have decided with their, that is the rabbis' consent, that the said Espinoza should be banned and separated from the nation of Israel, as they now put him under harem with the following harem. With the judgment of the angels and with that of the saints, we put under harem, ostracize, and curse and damn Baruch de Espinoza, with the consent of blessed God and with the consent of this entire holy congregation, before these holy scrolls, with the 613 precepts which are written in them, with the harem that Joshua put upon Jericho, with the curse with which Elisha cursed the youth, and with all of the curses that are written in the law. Cursed be he by day, cursed be he by night. Cursed be he when he lies down, and cursed be he when he rises up. Cursed be he when he goes out, and cursed be he when he comes in. The Lord will not forgive him. The fury and zeal of the Lord will burn against this man and bring upon him all the curses that are written in this book of the law. And may the Lord erase his name from under the heavens. And may the Lord separate him for evil from all of the tribes of Israel with all of the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the law. And you that cleave unto the Lord your God, all of you are alive today. We warn that no one should communicate with him orally or in writing, nor provide him any favor, nor be with him under the same roof, nor be within four cubits of him, nor read any paper composed or written by him. Well, this is a, a remarkable document. Um, Spinoza has clearly pissed somebody off. Uh, you notice, though, that it speaks in very general terms of abominable heresies and monstrous deeds, but without telling us what they were. Um, I title this talk, Why Was Spinoza Excommunicated? But you'll notice that the word excommunication is not used here, um, although it's often spoken of an excommun as an excommunication. I think that's the wrong word, uh, primarily because excommunication is um, really is a liturgical or religious um, event within Christianity, uh, but Judaism, first of all, has no communion. Uh, and secondly, a harem is much broader than an excommunication. A harem is not just a religious or liturgical ostracism, but the person put under harem is going to experience social, economic, um, and deeply personal ostracism or ban from the community. Um, it was not an uncommon thing to happen, especially in Amsterdam in this period. Uh, you could be put under harem for a variety of offenses. Um, for example, religious offenses, such as not attending synagogue or um, uh, creating your own prayer quorum uh, outside of the official um, services. Um, you could be put under harem for uh, unscrupulous business dealings, for example, cheating uh, fellow merchants. Um, there were legal, moral, and social offenses that would get you put under harem. Uh, Portuguese Jewish women were not allowed to cut the hair of Gentile women. Uh, sexual relations between Jews and Gentiles were forbidden, and if you violated that, you would be put under harem. Um, you could be put under harem for taking a book out of the library without permission. You could be put under harem for insulting a rabbi for um, a, physically assaulting a member of the board of directors. A long list of um, rules governing the use of the harem in Amsterdam in this period. Um, one of the more interesting ones is um, a man was put under harem, and we have the document which, which provides very few details, but the document does say that the man was put under harem for circumcising a Polish man without permission. 
um, and we can only hope it was not without the Polish man's permission. Um, usually, most of the harems that we see in this period are rather mild. Um, a person is put under harem, um, ostracized for a day, a couple of days, or a week, and then the harem would be lifted after the person uh, apologized for whatever their offense may have been and paid a fine. None of the harems that we have from this period even approach the length of Spinoza's harem, the vitriol that's being directed at him, the long list of curses. Um, this is a, a really extreme case of ostracism from this community. And it was final. Um, it was never lifted. Uh, and it doesn't look like either the community or the person who is being banned with this harem had any interest in having it lifted. Um, one interesting question is why Amsterdam used the harem so often, and I'll talk about that in a second. But first, let's consider who was the object of this punishment, and his name was Bento de Spinoza. Um, Bento was his um, given name as a member of the Portuguese community in Amsterdam. Uh, Baruch would have been his name in the synagogue. He was born in Amsterdam in 1632. Uh, he died in The Hague in 1677. He was um, like so members of this community, um, uh, he belonged to a family that originated in Portugal. Um, in the late 15th and early 16th century, with the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, and then later, somewhat a little bit later from Portugal, many of the Spanish and Portuguese Jews um, fled around the Mediterranean. They ended up in Rome, in Salonica, um, in Morocco, uh, some ended up in Hamburg, uh, a few in France, but eventually a large, uh, a decent number, I would say a large number, a decent number ended up in Amsterdam uh, because they got the, um, the impression that they would be able to return to Judaism. They've been forced to convert to Catholicism in Spain and Portugal, and the Inquisition uh, did not treat them well. The Inquisition did not care if you were Jewish, it did care if you were a Christian who was insincere in their Christianity. And so the Inquisition took a very deep interest in these conversos, former Jews, because they suspected they may have been practicing Judaism in secret. So life was difficult, and eventually um, a sufficient number fled and ended up in Amsterdam, where by the early 17th century, they formed um, several congregations um, and were pretty much allowed to practice their Judaism, uh, if not openly in public, at least in secret with a wink. There's a story about how one day the sheriff in Amsterdam was walking past a house and he heard uh, from the house uh, strange language. And he thought it was uh, Latin and that he had caught uh, a group of Catholics secretly practicing a Catholic mass. Now, th these Calvinists who were in charge of the Netherlands were not about to let Catholics start practicing their religion. So the sheriff burst in and arrested everybody. And when it was explained to him that these were not in fact Catholics, but Jews, and that the strange language he heard was not Latin, but Hebrew, um, everyone was released with apologies. By the time Spinoza was born in 1632, there were three congregations um, in Amsterdam. Um, this is uh, an image from the time of the neighborhood. Um, is this bar in your way? There we go. Um, this street here along the bottom is, uh, was soon called the Jode Breestraat, the Jews Broad Street, because a number, a uh, large number of the houses along this boulevard were owned by Portuguese Jewish families, fairly well off ones because these are expensive homes. Um, this house right here, where I'm circling the cursor, this is Rembrandt's house. So if you've been to Amsterdam and visited the Rembrandt House Museum, it's right there. Spinoza's family were pretty sure lived back here, um, just behind it. Um, this island here, this big square island, it was also part of the Jewish quarter. Now Jews were not forced to live here. They could live anywhere they wanted in the city. There was no ghetto, but this was a new quarter of the city. And so there was housing available. These are, um, while the houses along the Yoda Breistrat were a lovely brick houses, the ones in the island here were less expensive and poorer Jews, and especially Ashkenazic Jews, who started arriving in the 1630s and 1640s, tended to live back here. Um, it was also the art quarter, and this street, in addition to having many Jewish families, was the home of many artists and uh, art studios and art dealers. 
Um, for a while, oops, um, the Jews practiced in this synagogue um, up until 1675. Um, this was a former home owned by a member of the community, transformed into a synagogue. Um, and it was not until the early 1670s that the Sephardic community built that magnificent synagogue that you could still see in Amsterdam. And if you ever go to Amsterdam, um, be sure to visit it. It's, it's truly beautiful. So this is where up until um, well after Spinoza's Cherem, um, the Jewish community held, the Sephardic or Portuguese Jewish community held its services. I should say there was no love lost between the Sephardic Jews and the Ashkenazic Jews in Amsterdam. The Sephardic Jews tended to be, for the most part, relatively well-off middle-class merchants, professionals, and some rather very wealthy individuals. Whereas the Ashkenazic Jews who were fleeing in from Germany and then later Lithuania and Poland tended to be rather poor. Um, at the same time, the Sephardic Jews who created these communities in Amsterdam had been cut off for generations from Jewish traditions because they were living in Spain and Portugal where they were not allowed to practice. And so when they moved to Amsterdam, they had to really relearn or learn for the first time um, normative Judaism. Whereas the Ashkenazic Jews coming in from the East had long been living in open and practicing Jewish communities. But the Sephardic Jews of Amsterdam were somewhat ashamed of these relatively poor Ashkenazim, many of whom were begging in the streets. And um, they did what they could for the poor Ashkenazim, but at a certain point, they realized that um, this was really a bit of a scandal, and they were afraid that the Dutch would be annoyed. And so uh, at various times throughout the 17th century, charitable funds were taken up by the Portuguese Jews to send the Ashkenazic Jews elsewhere. So there's the background. This is the community that expelled Spinoza with great prejudice in 1656. Now, as I said, notice that the excommunication document speaks only of his abominable heresies and monstrous steeds without telling us what exactly they were. So there's a bit of a mystery here. What was Spinoza saying at this time? As far as we know, he hadn't written anything yet. He was only 23 years old. So he wasn't yet that philosopher who we think of as the author of these two works. Uh, on the left, you see uh, the Ethics, his metaphysical moral treatise, which he published, which was not published until after his death by his friends. And then on the right, the Theological Political Treatise, which he published anonymously in 1670. He has kept his name off the title page and even put a false city and publisher. Um, he realized that it would be not very well received. And in fact, it caused an enormous scandal. And uh, soon after the publication of the Theological Political Treatise, um, Spinoza was perhaps the most vilified, um, once they figured out who the author was, the most vilified man in Europe. And to be called a Spinozist was really, um, I suppose, like being called a communist in the United States in the 1940s and 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, and still today. Uh, it was a label that you used to really impugn um, the character and the beliefs of your enemies, whether it had any meaningful use or not. So Spinoza really did cause quite a scandal. But this was not until the 1670s. He hadn't written anything yet in 1656. So on the one hand, there's a mystery here. What was Spinoza saying? What were his abominable heresies and monstrous deeds? Now, some scholars have suggested that, in fact, the harem was not due to any heretical ideas, any philosophical uh, ideas, but rather that Spinoza had violated one of the community's regulations regarding um, finances. We do know that shortly before the harem, uh, Spinoza had taken over the family's importing business because his father had died. But what Spinoza inherited along with the business were all the debts that came with it. And he realized that he couldn't possibly meet these debts. The creditors were just way, way too many, and the amount of money owed was too much. Uh, given his age, he was allowed by Dutch law to declare himself an orphan. You didn't reach your uh, majority in the Netherlands or in Amsterdam until you were 25, and he was only 22, uh, 23. 
Uh, and so he went to the Dutch authorities and had himself declared an orphan, which cleared him of all these debts, and in fact made him a preferred creditor upon his mother's estate. Now, that, that was probably, in, in legal terms, a very wise move in financial terms, but it really was regarded by the Portuguese Jewish authorities as a serious offense. First, first of all, because he went over their heads to Dutch authorities to resolve a matter that was mostly, should have been resolved within the Jewish community. Secondly, by having himself relieved of debts in this way, the Jewish leaders were afraid that this would undermine the uh, trustworthiness of members of the community, that they would no longer be regarded as people who would meet their debts and their obligations. And so one scholar has argued that this was the reason for the harem. I have to say I'm not convinced because the length and the vitriol and the curses lobbed at Spinoza in that extraordinary dark document, first of all, speak of abominable heresies. It doesn't speak of financial mis mistransactions. Uh, secondly, um, it, it's really hard to believe that uh, even a financial offense as serious as the one that Spinoza may have engaged in would have brought down upon him so serious uh, a punishment as that. I think we should take the document at, his, at its word and that Spinoza was put under harem for his ideas. And in fact, if you read these treatises, there's really no mystery here. If Spinoza was saying some of the things around 1656 that he would end up putting down on paper in the 1660s and 1670s, then there's really no mystery. Um, and what, what I want to do now is look at some of the main ideas of Spinoza's philosophy, because I, there's good reason for thinking that these were, in fact, things he was saying um, to people if they asked him. Um, in the 1650s, and word got around that Spinoza held these views. And I think that would have been sufficient um, to bring him the harem that he received. So what are these ideas? First, Spinoza denies that there is any such thing as a providential God. To believe in a providential God, such as we see in the Hebrew Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, is to fall prey to a pernicious anthropomorphic superstition. This is to treat God as a kind of person who has certain psychological characteristics like beliefs and expectations and makes judgments and issues commands. And it's to believe in a God who has moral characteristics like justice and vengeance and issues rewards and punishments. Spinoza's God has none of those psychological characteristics, none of those moral characteristics. What God is for Spinoza is nature, or to put it another way, all there is is nature. There is no transcendent deity who is capable of exercising providence in the way in which the deity of the Hebrew Bible acts. That is just a pernicious, pernicious superstitious conception of what God is. All there is, is nature. And whatever exists, exists through the necessity of nature's laws. There was no first act of creation. There, was no, there will be no final judgment. Whatever happens comes about with the causal necessity, just as leaves fall off of trees and rocks roll down hills, just as human beings um, go through their life subject to the laws of gravity. And in our minds, all of our thoughts and emotions, our volitions, our hopes and desires, all of these come about with necessity. They are all determined by causes. There is no such thing as free will. Nothing exists for the sake of anything else. There are no purposes in nature. There are no values in nature. Whatever it is, just is. Now, it's still the case that some things are good, and some things are bad, but they're not good in and of, in and of themselves. Uh, arsenic is just what it is. It's arsenic. It's neither good nor bad. It is bad, however, for human beings because it brings us harm. 
Knowledge and understanding, on the other hand, is good for human beings because it improves us. It brings us freedom and um, freedom and uh, tranquility in our lives. So yes, yeah, some things are good, some things are bad, but nothing is good or bad in and of itself. And nature as a whole is neither good nor bad. It just is. Typically, Spinoza is read as a kind of pantheist, somebody who sees God everywhere, that nature is full of the divinity. I think that's actually the wrong way to read Spinoza. I think he was an atheist. What he's saying is, all there is is God. I'm sorry, all there is is nature. Uh, and nature is not divine in the sense that it's deserving of worshipful awe or religious reverence. Nature just is. And the proper attitude to take towards nature is not worship or reverence, but understanding. You should get to know nature, because the more you understand nature, the better off you are. It follows as well that if Spinoza is right, there's no such thing as miracles. Miracles are absolutely metaphysically impossible, because if God is just nature, and nature just de- not, cannot possibly depart from its own laws. Well, then God cannot depart from nature's ways. So whatever happens, happens necessarily by the laws of nature. And those laws are themselves absolutely necessary. So there cannot possibly be any violations of nature's law. Spinoza's claim here is very strong. Um, a later philosopher um, in the 18th century, a Scottish philosopher named David Hume, Um, would say that you're never justified in believing that something is a miracle because the evidence that would require, that the evidence that would be required to believe that something happened miraculously would have to be so strong that it would overwhelm all the evidence that you have that the thing came about naturally. And so you're never justified in believing that an event is miraculous, no matter how strange or unique the event is. Hume didn't say that miracles are impossible. He just said you're never justified in believing in them. But Spinoza says, no, they are impossible. Well, except for one exception, because there was a miracle. All right, next view. Spinoza's views on the Bible. According to Spinoza, and this follows from his conception of what God is, The Bible is not literally authored by God, because God, not being a kind of person or an agent who does things, God doesn't write works of literature. God doesn't dictate things. God doesn't compose books. The Bible is simply a work of human literature. In fact, it's an anthology of human literature, and what it contains are writings by a number of individuals writing over a long period of time in different historical and political circumstances. And those writings were handed down from generation to generation, um, and they went through many transcriptions, and so errors crept in, changes, like a game of telephone, um, except in this case with with written, um, you know, things written down. Um, And eventually all of these writings were select, some of these writings were selected and put together by a team of editors in the Second Temple period. And what we have now, Spinoza says, is a rather corrupt and mutilated document, because who knows how much of it really reflects what was written originally. So the Bible is just a work of human literature, and a a very fallible one at that by many authors. Is there any sense in which it is divine? Well, Spinoza says, yeah, there is. But the only sense in which scripture is divine is that the authors were tended to be moral individuals with vivid imaginations. They weren't philosophers. So just because the Bible describes God in a certain way or describes oceans parting, uh, it doesn't mean those things actually happen. That may have been what the prophets believed. But because the philosophers were not into, were not philo- because the prophets were not philosophers, just because they had certain beliefs about God doesn't mean those beliefs were true. However, they were especially moral individuals with vivid imaginations, and so what they could do is create inspiring stories that would move us to treat people with justice and charity. 
And he says, Spinoza says, if there's any sense in which the Bible, the Hebrew Bible is divine, it's that it inspires us to obey God's law. But God's law is simply treat other human beings with justice and charity or love your neighbor. And so if the Bible is especially good at inspiring us to be ethical, then it's divine. But then again, if reading um, Shakespeare or Jane Austen or any work of human literature inspires you to be moral, then that book would be divine. It's just that the Bible happens to do a particularly good job at it. But let's say you read the Bible and you're inspired by God's behavior not to treat other people with just charity, but to be to act with vengeance and cruelty. Well, then for you, the Bible is not a divine book because it doesn't move you towards just behavior. All right, third thesis of Spinoza's philosophy. Jewish law is no longer binding on Latter-day Jews. Moses instituted the law at a very particular historical moment and a very particular political moment in Israelite history. Having just been liberated from slavery in Egypt, Moses needed to come up with laws that would create cohesiveness and unity among the people he was leading. And so he came up with the 613 commandments of the Torah and uh, promoted God as their author in order to inspire obedience to these laws, create unity, and also allow these people to see themselves as different from other people. And so there's a very political um, motive behind Jewish law. And then with the building of the temple, so many of the ceremonies and rites and observances of Judaism became centered around uh, temple sacrifice and temple worship. However, those historical and political circumstances are long gone. And the temple was destroyed. At, remember, Spinoza's writing in the 17th century. The temple was destroyed um, almost 1,700 years earlier. And so without temple worship and without the political and historical circumstances of the Israelite exiles, all of those or most of those laws of the Hebrew Bible have lost their validity. They've lost their raison d'etre. And now they're just meaningless, superstitious behaviors grounded in superstitious beliefs. They're no longer binding no longer normative upon Latter-day Jews. Spinoza says that what Judaism, or sorry, what true religion consists in is not obeying some kind of superstition, not engaging in any kind of superstitious ceremonies or obeying out-of-date laws. True religion is simply loving your neighbors and treating them with justice and charity. And you do that by improving their lives, by acting towards them with benevolence and helping them become wise and free and more rational. In fact, as a rational person, I would have to see that it is in my own best interest to help other people lead rational lives. Finally, um, and I think this may have been one of the more important features of Spinoza's philosophy. He says there's no such thing as an immortal soul. In fact, this is the most pernicious and superstitious belief of all. There's no such thing as a world to come. There is no heaven in which the virtuous will be rewarded. There is no hell in which the vicious will be punished. There's no afterlife. When you are dead, you are dead. And that's all there is. So, if there are rewards for being virtuous, those rewards come in this lifetime. And if virtue is defined as leading a rational and moral life, Spinoza's claim is that it's in your own best interest to do so, because that is where happiness lies. On the other hand, to believe that there's such a thing as an immortal soul, that there's an afterlife in which you will be rewarded or punished, that leads to a life, not of freedom, but a life of enslavement, an enslavement of mind and body. Because if you really believe in this kind of afterlife and immortality, most of your life in this world will be full of hopes and fears, irrational hopes and fears. 
an irrational hope for reward in heaven and an irrational fear of punishment in hell. And if that's how you're leading your life, you're actually going to throw yourself at the mercy of rabbis or priests or pastors or imams because they're telling you that they know how to get to heaven. That is not a life of freedom. That is a life of bondage and irrational passion and enslavement to ecclesiastic authorities. Spinoza's philosophy, in fact, I think is devoted to eliminating this pernicious, superstitious belief. He does say there is a kind of eternity that we can enjoy, but it's an eternity that we enjoy in this life insofar as the more knowledge we have, the more understanding we have of eternal truths. And the more understanding we have of eternal truths, the more we know about ourselves, about nature, and about the meaning of life. And what you realize when you realize all that is that there is no afterlife. And therefore, don't think so much about death. Don't obsess about death. Don't devote your life to avoiding some kind of um, punishment in the hereafter. Think about this life and the rewards to be achieved by being a good person here. Spinoza reportedly responded to the harem with nonchalance. In fact, I'm pretty sure that by this point he had lost his faith anyway and would have been leaving the community if he didn't depend so much on continuing his business for his financial well-being. One of his early biographers says that he re responded in the following way, all the better, they do not force me to do anything that I would not have done of my own accord if I did not dread scandal. But since they want it that way, I gladly enter on the path that is open to me with the consolation that my departure will be more innocent than was the exodus of the early Hebrews from Egypt. Spinoza, in other words, was done with the community, was done with Judaism, and they were done with him. And he would go on to write uh, his philosophical works, go on to pursue his philosophical career, scandalous books, which his critics said were forged in hell by the devil itself. Well, one question I'd like to raise is, all this took place in the 17th century. Why should we care? Spinoza, he's interesting to read. Um, in fact, once you start reading him, it's easy to get obsessed with Spinoza, and I speak from personal experience. But why should we care today about uh, this thinker um, 350 years ago? Because I think what we're, what Spinoza has to tell us is still valid, namely that you have a choice to make what kind of life you're going to lead. Are you going to lead a life of reason where you're devoted to the pursuit of knowledge, to understanding, not to unjustified and false and illusory and superstitious beliefs, but to knowing the truth about nature, knowing the truth about ourselves, knowing moral truths about what's right and wrong and what's good and bad, and especially how to treat other human beings. Spinoza believed that once you had those deep insights into nature and gave up the belief in a God who acts with free will, a God who arbitrarily and even capriciously uh, behaves towards human beings who it wants to worship him, um, that is not the path to happiness. The path to happiness, to well-being and peace of mind, is to recognize the necessity of all things in nature. Because when you, when you know the necessity of all things, you will pursue those things that are truly good, things that are under your control, your emotions. And this is, I think, a very stoic side of Spinoza's philosophy. Um, your emotions will be under your control because you will not get overly wrought at the loss of things that weren't under your control. You won't pursue transitory and, tra and contingent goods like wealth, honor, and power but rather you will pursue true goods like understanding and knowledge and peace of mind, things that, if you do it properly, are under your control. Also, Spinoza had much to say about church and state, um, of course, an issue of great concern to us today. It's often been said that Spinoza was an early proponent of the separation of church and state. Uh, I don't think that's right. Uh, in fact, Spinoza believed that civil authorities should be in control of, of public exercises of religion. 
People should be absolutely free to believe whatever they want. That's clear in Spinoza. People should be able to not just believe, but say whatever they want. He was a, uh, he was a really a nearly absolute proponent of freedom of belief and freedom of speech. However, he was afraid that when it came to public activities, public practices like worship activities, that if you allow the church too much autonomy, and by church here I just mean any kind of organized religion, you're going to have a division of loyalty in the states, a division of sovereignty. Are people more devoted to the state or are they more devoted to their religion? And in Spinoza's mind, to introduce that kind of division of authority, that division of sovereignty, is, uh, is exactly what caused the ruin of the ancient Israelite kingdom and would cause the ruin of, of any uh, modern civil society. Therefore, the state, pe while, while people should be allowed to think and say whatever they want, and even worship however they want in the privacy of their homes, when it came to public activities, the civil authorities should be able to determine what is permissible and what is not, all for the sake of social and civil peace. So are you going to choose the life of reason, the life of understanding, the life of social and civil well-being, or are you going to pursue the life of irrational passions? On the left here, you see um, an event that took place in The Hague in 1672, just down the road from where Spinoza was living at the time. This is the, the murderous assassination of the De Witt brothers. The De Witt brothers were effectively the political leaders of the Dutch Republic. But it was believed that they were not, that they were traitors, that they were, um, in fact, allowing France, which had recently invaded the Dutch Republic, uh, they had collaborated with the French. And uh, a, a mob burst in, dragged the two brothers out into the street, and literally tore them limb to limb. Spinoza wanted to go out and accuse the mob of being barbarians, but his landlord wisely kept him from doing so. But here you see, um, you know, a, a natural behavior of people given into irrational passions. What's going on the right? Going on on the right? Well, we think we all know what's happening there. So there's your choice for Spinoza, a life of reason or the life of passions. And again, I would say, don't take my word for it. Read Spinoza's works. I, they're, they're not easy, but I think um, they're fascinating and still very relevant today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would you unshare your screen? We'll do some questions. I People will. are sharing. So uh, terrific. Um, obviously, you have a lot more to say about Spinoza since you've written three books and maybe you're even working on more. I don't know. Um, at CSP, we have a store and we create t-shirts. I was thinking of a t-shirt. The front would say Spinozaist and the Spinozaist and the back would say, you know, abominable heresies, monstrous deeds. That's great. I love that. Yeah. See, people get that. Um, so Keep, uh, people have shared lots of questions, so let's let's keep uh, sharing them if you have more. But here are the ones that I've picked out. Um, first question. So did anybody ever remove the cherem? Can we remove the cherem basically later in history? It seems like one of those uh, movies where, you know, someone is confirmed to um, this curse, but it can be removed later. So can this cherem be removed? Can Deb Schubach put together a group? Who can do it? Or is it not possible? Uh, great question. Um Technically, the only people who can remove the harem are the people who placed it on him, and that would be the leaders, the board of directors of the Amsterdam Portuguese Jewish community. So despite all these attempts over the centuries, um, David Ben-Gurion going to, um, I guess, I think it was on Mount uh, somewhere in Jerusalem, um, and saying, um, Spinoza, you are our brother, or um, uh, Jacob Klatskin on Mount Scopus saying, I hereby uh, remove the harem. They had no authority to do so. In 2015, however, the Amsterdam Portuguese community commissioned uh, a number of us, four of us, to um, report on the harem. And they asked us who, you know, asked us for information about who Spinoza was, what were his ideas, what do we think were the reasons behind the harem, and should the, are there any benefits to lifting the harem? Uh, there were four of us on this committee. Um, three of us, the three of us who were Jewish, said, no, you, you don't lift the harem. Uh, the one person in the committee who was not Jewish said, yes, you do lift a harem. It, it's, a, it's a scandal. 
Uh, those of us who argued against living the harem, now let me just be clear, I am not in favor of harems. I do not think people should be punished for their ideas. I absolutely find it abhorrent to have a harem put on somebody for their philosophical views. However, first of all, a harem is a punishment, it's a social and liturgical ostracism of a living person. Spinoza is no longer living, so what's the point of lifting the harem? Second, um, Spinoza's own attitude would be, I couldn't care less. Lift it, don't lift it, it makes no difference to me. The rabbi, uh, and then, so in 2015, the community brought us um, to Amsterdam, and there was a big public forum where we presented our reports, and there was essentially a, a, a debate, and the present rabbi of the community was there, and a, an audience of 500 people, um, and the question was, should the harem be lifted? And the present rabbi said, no, I will not lift the harem. And his reasoning was, first of all, am I that much wiser and more, do I, am I that much wiser than my 17th century colleagues that I can overrule them? Second, um, Spinoza knew the rules of the game and his offenses, if such as they, such as they were, were offenses that earned him properly a harem. Uh, and so this rabbi was unwilling to go back against what his earlier colleagues had done, especially because we don't really know the reasons behind the ban, whereas the 17th century uh, directors did. Uh, finally, this rabbi also said, I think this is very nice, said, look, you go out and read as much Spinoza as you want, um, but I'm not going to lift the ban. So for now, at least, it looks like the ban is going to stay in place. And again, the only authority that could lift it would be the board of directors of the Amsterdam community. Okay. Um, thanks for sharing that. There are lots of questions about Spinoza's views that you articulated and where they came from. Did Spinoza, do we know who Spinoza read, for example, did he read Maimonides, did he read other um, uh, famous Jewish philosophers of the time or earlier? Um, was he reading other writers in, the round, in, in and around his time period? Or are his ideas unique? Usually people get ideas from where they live, when they live, who they interact with. So where did Spinoza, you know, who influenced him, I guess? So I want to say, yes, his ideas are unique. And yes, they came from many sources. Um, we absolutely, we know Spinoza read Maimonides because he cites Maimonides. Uh, he's critical of Maimonides, especially his views on how to interpret scripture. Uh, but also it's clear that he was influenced by Maimonides and his views on prophecy and especially in his views on immortality. So yes, he, I think he was well steeped in Maimonides. I think he read Gersonides, uh, Ibn Ezra, uh, Kreskas, and, and a host of other medieval Jewish thinkers. He was also deeply influenced by ancient Stoicism. We know he read Epictetus and Seneca. We have, in fact, the inventory of his library when he died, so we know what books he owned. Of course, just because you owned a book doesn't mean you read it, and there were many books he read that he probably didn't own. But we know that he was well-versed in ancient philosophy, Aristotle, and ancient Stoicism. He was also, um, perhaps the first real philosophy that he studied closely was Descartes, uh, seven, earlier 17th century thinker. And we also know that he read Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, a 17th century British uh, political philosopher. And so uh, Spinoza's philosophy, in one respect, um, really brings together uh, a number of streams of philosophical thinking. Jewish, uh, ancient, um, contemporary Dutch Republican thinking, uh, Cartesian science, and so on. At the same time, Spinoza was extraordinarily brilliant. And I think despite all these influences, his philosophy and the conclusions he drew from Maimonides and from Descartes are extraordinarily original, um, no question about it. Um. People asked, well, he was cut up for these views. These views were not just um, um, worthy of harem in the Jewish world, but I assume he got in trouble in the Christian world as well, given what you are, again, outlined. So how did he, what happened with him in the greater world, outside of the Jewish world? Oh, he was the devil itself. Um, and, you know, he was, his works were condemned by uh, Protestant uh, churches, by civil authorities, by Catholic churches. They were ended up on the Index of Prohibited Books. So Spinoza had uh, really a, a really mean reputation in the Gentile world. 
Uh, what's interesting, and this really, uh, I think, brings up a new perspective on the harem itself. Um, I think the, the leaders of the Jewish, Portuguese Jewish community recognized um, how dangerous his ideas were, especially that they would be offensive uh, to Calvinists. Even though Spinoza denies free will and Calvinists deny free will, his views on the Bible and his views on immortality would be regarded just as offensively by um, the Protestants as by the Jewish community. And it may be that the decision to so harshly punish Spinoza was a kind of political act, a way of um, signaling to the Dutch that, hey, you know, we can keep our house clean. We take care of heretics. Don't worry about us. Because remember that this was a refugee community. Um, they were not, most of them were not formally citizens of the Dutch Republic. And so there was throughout the 17th century, a, a bit of insecurity about their status in Dutch society and having already been exiled from Spain and Portugal did not want to be forced out again. And so uh, perhaps by issuing such a harsh ban on this radical, the Portuguese Jews may have been saying to the Dutch, don't worry about us. We're not going to be a haven for heretics. Hmm. How did um, Spinoza then function in a society where apparently no one would interact or liked him? How much money did he have? Was he able to, I mean, I, I don't know if you mentioned, did he get married? Did he have a family? Did he, I mean, he seemed, he, it would be someone working by themselves, but he, I mean, the portrait you shared, people asked about that. Like, that seems like a very wealthy person to get a portrait like that. Um, so how did he live after this? Well, to, to use a classic response, he was comfortable. <laughs> um, it's, it's not that he didn't have friends. He wasn't some kind of loner. Uh, in a set. I mean, there's this myth that Spinoza just, kept himself isolated, working on his, um, on his philosophy. He died young. He was only 44. Um, no, he had, a, he had a very loyal circle of friends, especially in Amsterdam. He met with them frequently. They talked philosophy. They read his works in manuscript. Um, I get the sense that he was rather charismatic and um, attracted not just enemies and critics, but followers. Um, he made some money through his lens grinding. He was reportedly a very good lens grinder. And the scientist Christian Huygens um, um, had very good things to say about Spinoza's lenses. But we also know that some of his friends uh, supported him financially. Um, we don't know a lot about his personal life. There's no evidence that he ever got married or ever had a love affair. Uh, the problem is that when he died and his friends collected all of his papers, um, they published the books, they published the manuscripts that hadn't been published yet. And they published a collection of his letters, but they only included letters that were of philosophical interest, and they destroyed all the letters that had any personal information. And so we really have no idea about much of Spinoza's personal life. Did he die as a Jew? You know, is he... He died under harem, so... no. I mean, I, you know what I mean? Was he, like, if you were there when he was dying and someone asked a question about, was his death suspicious? So that may be a question we can explore. But um, would he, would if you asked him, would he die? Would he be dying as a Jew, no, not a religious Jew, as, but as a Jew? He say, "I'm dying as a free man." Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. And my, here's my answer: I, when you read Spinoza's works, you get the sense that he had no residual sense of Jewish identity. He didn't see himself as Jewish. He saw himself as an individual. And so, in fact. You know, he's often called somebody who envisioned a, a kind of secular Judaism or reform Judaism. I think that's wrong. I think what Spinoza envisioned was not a reform of Judaism, but a reform of religion, moving it away from any kind of organized sectarian, superstitious, ceremonial religion towards this strictly moral character. And so I'm sure he did not want any um, anybody reciting um, Kaddish at his death. I don't think he had any residual sense of being Jewish. And in his works, he often refers to the Jews in the third person. They're the ones who had these superstitions. They emasculate themselves with these uh, ceremonies and so on. Um, for Spinoza, Judaism was the law. And when you get rid of the law, you get rid of Judaism. Hmm. Uh, people have asked, uh, where, where is he buried? He's buried in a, in a cemetery outside The Hague. He would not have been permitted to be buried in the Portuguese cemetery um, in Outerkirk, which is um, 
just outside, about 10 kilometers outside of Amsterdam. His parents are buried there. And so are the rabbis, rabbis in the community, but he's buried in a, in a Christian cemetery in The Hague. You know, these, this, this community in Amsterdam would be putting like many people in Cherem today, I think, given what you've outlined is probably the, um, you know, most common belief amongst Jews in contemporary history. I mean, orthodoxy is a very small part of the contemporary world. So if you come outside of the orthodox world, you could probably take these tenants and ask the average Jew, and they may agree with almost everything you've just said. So um, they'd be very busy putting everybody in Hiram today. Um, when did when did Spinoza come back into the Jewish discussion? So um, you know his work was out there. Um, I don't. I and and was it kind of re, uh, referred to in in other writings at that time, or did it kind of disappear for a while, then come back? And when was Spinoza rediscovered if he was if he was lost? So um, he was never lost to the greater European intellectual world, but you see very little discussion of Spinoza in Jewish writings of the rest of the 17th century. Um, there were critics, the occasional critic from within Judaism, but for the most part, it really isn't until Mendelssohn in the latter part of the 18th century where, and I, I believe Mendelssohn was strongly influenced by Spinoza um, in a positive way. That is a lot of what Mendelssohn has to say about religion, I think, comes from Spinoza. Uh, but there was, uh, by the end of the 18th century, there was a big debate called the Pantheismus debate that involved uh, Mendelssohn and other thinkers. And that's really where you see a, a kind of resurgence of interest in Spinoza. And then through the 19th century, with the discovery of some of Spinoza's writings, uh, including a manuscript of a work that we didn't know, they didn't know existed until it was discovered in manuscript in the 19th century. And then um, all of a sudden, Spinoza becomes a topic of scholarly interest. So we're almost out of time. One question is, why did you write three books about Spinoza? Why not one book? I couldn't help myself. <laughs> I mean, what's the difference? Like, what did you, what, each book I assume is very different. Uh, yes, and you should buy all of them. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing about Spinoza is um, every time you read him, he gets more difficult. You think you understand him. And then you come upon something that raises new questions. And so you're forever wrestling with Spinoza. I think the same thing happens to scholars of Plato, scholars of Aristotle, uh, and so on, that um, a, really good and a really good philosopher, um, once they get a hold of you, they don't let go. And Spinoza, because Spinoza's ideas are so broad, he wrote on metaphysics, he wrote on nature, he wrote on uh, human psychology, on politics, on religion, on the Bible, on um, ethics. Um, there's so much there, and it's so rich and complicated that it's hard not to keep going back and discover new things that you thought you understood and you realize, no, no, I, I need to rethink that. Um, plus, I, I just find 17th century Amsterdam such a fascinating place, um, which is why I wrote the book on um, rep representations of Jews in 17th century Dutch art. Um, it's an interesting question. Why is it that in 17th century Dutch art, all of a sudden, um, there's a great interest in Jewish themes? I think a topic for another day, maybe. Sure. Um, was there anything suspicious about, since it was emailed me, anything suspicious about Spinoza's death? Or is that um, no. just he, speculation? So he probably had lifelong um, respiratory issues. Uh, he also, as a lens grinder, was inhaling glass dust um so he died at 44 and the um the reports of the time were that he died of pathesis which i assume is a kind of uh i'm sure there's a doctor in, in the house here um it, it's a respiratory disease and his lungs were damaged most likely from inhaling uh glass dust they didn't have masks back then um and no there's nothing suspicious about his death you know, but everybody wants a philosopher's death to be to be suspicious. Somebody wrote a book a couple of years ago that Descartes was poisoned. No, this, he died of the flu. That's it. It's not that interesting. Just uh, I want to end with the the image that you shared and that we found. Is it is this? Are there many paintings um, of Spinoza, or is this the only one that you shared that I shared that I found? And uh, can you tell us about that painting? Anything interesting we should know? Then we'll so wrap it up. So the only 
I think really authentically image we have of Spinoza is an engraving that his friends used in one of their editions of his collected works. And I say authentic because his friends knew what he looked like. And if they use this image, it must have resembled him. And you can find the image online. It's just type in um, engraving of Spinoza. The painting I showed you at the beginning is most likely based on that engraving. It wasn't done from life. And it's the basis of other copies of that painting. Um, there was recently discovered three or four years ago, a painting uh, on auction in Paris. And uh, this uh, Amsterdam art dealer has been arguing that it's a portrait of Spinoza. It's a very unusual painting by a painter named Baron Chat. Um, and it could very well be a portrait of Spinoza. And if so, it was most likely done from life because the dating of the painting is 1666. You'll also find lots of other images purportedly of Spinoza if you go online. Um, there's one where he's reading a book past all these um, rabbis who are um, astounded and they're, they're withdrawing from him. That's from the 19th century. That's got nothing to do with anything. Um, there's also uh, a painting um, of a man who I guess kind of looks like Spinoza, but it's not, it's, it's not really a portrait. So like so many of these um, images of philosophers, they're often just the product of the imagination. Yeah, and I'll end, I'll end I guess, by saying that the Kraft, uh, well, Mary Kraft and Jeff Kaufman, I guess, were in Amsterdam sometime. I don't know if it's recent or not, but they took a picture of the statue of Spinoza in Amsterdam. So I guess Amsterdam has, I don't know whether the, I don't know whether the Jewish community of Amsterdam like now claims or reclaims Spinoza, but Amsterdam has claimed Spinoza, right? Well, actually, it's a beautiful statue in a very central part of the city. Um, but let me I'll, I'll be finished with the recent episode. Um, if you go to the synagogue complex and go in the bookstore, they have books on Spinoza. They have books by Spinoza. They even have a little Spinoza puppet. Um, so in, in one sense, they're, they're taking pride in this in perhaps the most famous member ever of their community. On the other hand, um, last year, uh, an Israeli Spinoza scholar named Yitzhak Milamid um, went with an Israeli film crew to Amsterdam because they were doing a documentary on Spinoza. And he asked for permission to film in the synagogue itself. And the rabbi at the time said, no, absolutely not. And in fact, for even asking, you're now persona non grata. So he put him under harem, essentially. Okay. But the, <laughs> this was a great embarrassment to the community. Uh, they, they eventually fired the rabbi because, first of all, he didn't have the authority to put anybody to say, declare somebody's persona non grata. Uh, and secondly, um, they, you know, they welcome discussion of Spinoza. Uh, so no, this, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, I'm, I'm sure that they still would not allow a discussion of Spinoza to take place in the synagogue, but the community at large, I think welcomes a discussion of, of this philosopher. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this great um, discussion on the fourth day, fifth night, if it's a night for you, about Baruch Spinoza. Um, I will share the links of all of Professor Nadler's books on Spinoza. And um, yeah, lots of reading to do over the next uh, year between this Hanukkah and next Hanukkah. Hopefully you can read all those books and maybe the original, see what you think. So um, thank you for the terrific presentation. Everybody be safe, be healthy. Um, a lot of people are getting sick right now. So take care. <laughs> and uh, Happy Hanukkah. Thanks very happy much. Happy Hanukkah, everybody. Bye-bye.